So for this Advent season, your elders and a few of your elders in training, we're together in a group meeting, and we're kind of talking about what would be good to go over for the Advent season. And we decide on John chapter 1. And so we're divvying up who's going to speak on what passage. So we're going to turn style it. You're going to get elder here, elder in training, elder in training, elder. And like always, if you haven't noticed, there's a pattern. At any time we turn style it, there's one thing that's for sure. Brandon Allen will speak before I speak. (laughs) And there is a reason for that. And everyone in the room knows it, but no one wants to say it to my face. And I know what it is, guys. And Brandon's not in the room right now. I haven't seen him this morning. He might be in the back with the kids. Might be doing something. But it's because, you know, he gets in there and he, he, you know, he takes care of it. And then they send the backup quarterback like me in there. And they say, all right, you know, just clean it up. Just go out there, take some knees. Finish it out. So that's hopefully not true for you guys. So we're in John 1. We're going to go verse by verse. Nothing super spectacular. The title we're going to give one today will be The Grace Bringer. Nate talked about Jesus being the light bringer. Life bringer, I'm sorry. No light. Light. And then Brandon talked about life. Talk about grace today. We're going to spend a lot of time in verse 14. So when you're saying, oh my gosh, he's still in verse 14, are we going to finish this thing out? As Cooper always tells me, I'm long-winded, even though he's only seen me speak once before he said that to me, (laughs) that we are going to move a little bit faster after verse 14. So let's start in verse 14. So John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So every world religion essentially is going to tell you something like this. Be good, go get God. Receive a reward that will be something like heaven. Islam will tell you, live a righteous life according to the Quran. Follow the pillars. You might receive heaven. There's no guarantee. Judaism, modern day Judaism will tell you, Follow the law to a certain extent. Follow the word of the prophets to a certain extent. In the Old Testament scripture and the Torah, you might receive heaven. There's no guarantee. Buddhism, for the most part, some of their sects believe in heaven and hell, but for the most part, they're going to believe in something called enlightenment. That is, live a good life. You might be reincarnated. You might need to live multiple good lives. But if you keep living good lives a very vague definition of good, you will receive either a heaven or an enlightenment where it will be like reaching the highest state of being. And then Hinduism will tell you something very similar, that there is gods, but it's not really the goal. The goal is just to live somewhat, some kind of good life, and you'll reach nirvana, which is very similar to enlightenment. Be good, go get God. Christianity is unique and is the only religion that says, you are not good. You cannot get God. God has come for you. Christ has become man. The Word has become flesh. God has come to get you, to guarantee you salvation. The reward isn't heaven. The reward is Jesus. It is completely backwards. The incarnation is something that in our culture we can have a real rough time of treating it as something very just cliche, something uh, just looking at, you know, Jesus in a manger and treating it as a very, mm, you know, it's like almost like a fairy tale, or almost like a nice little story that you tell your kids. But it's actually something that's incredibly miraculous. It's, it's strange. You don't find it in other world stories. We don't find it in other cultures. It's unique to Christianity. And that's because Jesus has uniquely and personally come to you as a man, the God-man, to get you and to accomplish what it takes to get you to him and the Father and to make a right relationship. So, one of the first things I want to talk about 
is John, right here in verse 14, calls Jesus the only son. So this really points to two specific things I want to bring up real quick, just hit points. One is that he's pointing to Christ's divinity in the same way that Nate really covered this really well in the first five verses, that Christ is God. And this was not just some easy claim to make. This was incredibly heretical. This was incredibly offensive to Jews. And to Greeks, it was foolishness. To claim that this man they were seeing before them, that they had seen in John writing after Christ's death and resurrection, that they had seen die, was God. And that he'd been God for all of eternity. And he'd been with God. And so that brings us to another point. So not only is Christ divine, not only is this man 100% man, but 100% God, he's also part of the Godhead or the Trinity. So the Bible will refer- reference it as the Godhead. Doctrine of the Trinity is what people will call it. And what that just means is that as we see in today, we'll refer to Jesus as the only Son. Refer to God as the Father. And then we'll refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit. And that they make up the Godhead. Three person, one God. So the reason I go over that is because when you get to verse 18, it gets kind of confusing. And he says things like, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And it seems like it's referring to almost four different people right there, but it's not. In verses like that, it's important to clarify what does this mean. So I'm going to try my best today to not just refer to God as God, but as God the Father when it's appropriate and Jesus as the Son, and the Holy Spirit in His work referred to as the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit more clear on His part. So, why did Jesus need to be, why did the Word need to become flesh? Well, there's a necessity of it. For the Gospel to work correctly, God needed to become man, and he needed to fulfill your part of the deal. When we take a look inside of ourselves, one thing that we all desperately want is to be our own God and our own Savior. We all desperately want to be our own answer to everything in life. Our culture glorifies that so strongly. It says, do what's going to make you happy. Do what's right for you. Follow your dreams. In all those phrases, in a sense, in a very watered-down sense, not all those phrases are entirely wrong. But in a broader scale, when it just makes you the center of the universe, it really reaches out to the problem that we have, is that we're sinners that don't want a Savior that's not us. And honestly, we just want to be our own God. And so we're given the law, and when we're given the law, it points us to the fact that here's how to live a righteous life, and you don't want to do it, and I don't want to do it. The Old Testament law is not that hard. If you look at a child and you tell them, hey, don't do this. Don't touch this. You can touch everything else in the room. Don't touch this one specific thing. Do you know what that child's going to touch? That one specific thing. Do you know that is the very first story in the Word of God? That God says, don't eat of one tree? How big is the earth? One tree. That should have been a layup right there. That should have been so easy. No one should have failed that test. But we actually find out through Scripture, and then if you just look and you're in, inside your own self analytically, you're going to find out, oh my gosh, I would have failed that test too. The reason that Adam and Eve failed that test is because I'm just like them. I'm a human, 
And I'm a sinner. And that's what I want to do. I want to sin. Really happy sermon today. So Christ had to come. Jesus, the Son, the Word, had to become flesh to fulfill your part. It is a necess- it's a necessary half of the gospel that you are not going to go out and live a sinless life, a righteous life. And you know what? More than that, you're not going to go out and die the sinner's death you're supposed to die. Christ did the right part that you can't do, and then he still took your punishment. So he goes out and accomplishes what you can't accomplish, and says, but I still got to take their punishment because they can't accomplish it. And he goes to the cross and takes a horrible death, and not only physically horrible, and not only especially physically horrible, but also spiritually horrible in a way that we can't completely comprehend to take all of sin upon himself. And then he still fulfills the side of God as well. And he's resurrected to be king forever and to forever have a human body. So here we see the climax of history is that God would literally enter human history and take on flesh and take it on forever. That even right now, your king sympathizes with you, for he still has a glorified body, but a body. He's still fulfilling your part of the deal forever. He's looking over it. He's given his Holy Spirit as a seal of it. So I want to take one step back, still looking at this. When Jesus became flesh... That even in itself can be a little confusing just in the sense of what do you mean when you say Jesus, when God entered history, God took on a body, became flesh. There's a reason there's that word's used there. It's to point out that God didn't just borrow a body. God didn't just possess someone. God didn't just, as some people think, change mask. It wasn't that we were seeing the Father through the Old Testament and now we're seeing the Son It's that he literally took on flesh. So even that wording is important to understand what honestly is a pretty great mystery. So right here we have a mystery of the incarnation, which is the word becoming flesh, Jesus being born. We have the the Trinity or the Godhead. And honestly, they're both a little mysterious to us. I can't completely explain to you how Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Because if you are past second grade, you know that math probably doesn't add up too well. I can't completely explain to you what it means in some sense that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three person, one God. In perfect relationship. But... Christ entering history gives us enough about it. It helps us understand enough. We're going to find, especially in these latter verses, that he's literally revealing God to us. This word dwelt right here, in the Greek it's the verb, that I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't check to see if I'm pronouncing this right, but you probably don't know Greek, so I'm probably good. Skenu, S-K-E-N-O-O. I took some Greek in high school. I don't remember, honestly, how how any of it works. But skenu. And that word in the Old Testament is used specifically a lot of times for two things. One, as in to pitch a tabernacle or to pinch a tent. So, do you remember when we were going through Exodus? And honestly, this is kind of interesting 
back to referencing what I said earlier, Brandon went over the, where he had that, where we, I mean, they just, they were like, Brandon, you're so good. You can have six chapters all about the tabernacle because that's just the most interesting part of Exodus. And he did such a good job up here. And then a couple of weeks later, after speaking about the tabernacle, we spoke about what was called the tent of meeting, which is like the worst name for a tent ever. Like, hey, we're going to meet in this tent. What should we call it? How about the tent of meeting? Okay. So we spoke about these two things. There was something specific about these two things. In the tabernacle, God's glory dwelt. And in the tent of meeting, it got a little bit more personal. Moses would go in and it would say he would actually sit before God's form, his glory. Not truly seeing God face to face, but seeing a form of God face to face, and he would get advice, he would learn from the Lord. It's actually, it's really, it's really just like real quick in 33 and 34. It's not really emphasized super strongly that second part. The tabernacle is, like I said, it's quite a large part. And what we see right here in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Skanu, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace in truth. You see that Jesus is showing us God's glory in a way that we have never seen before, in a more personal way than the tabernacle where God's glory dwelt, and in a more personal way than the tent of meeting where Moses would sit somewhat face to face with God's form. But there's something really interesting about that that uh, I was reading some really great commentaries, and they were speaking on that Greek-speaking Jews had a really strong understanding, is when he said this right here, is that in the Old Testament, to see God's glory fully would mean death. If you remember back, once again in Exodus, Moses is on top of the mountain, he's receiving the commandments, and God doesn't allow Moses to see his face. He allows Moses to see his backside, his afterglow, in a sense. That if Moses was to fully see the Lord and his glory for what it was, it would kill him. And we know from the tabernacle and how specific and careful they were in tying ropes to the priests before they went into the glory that they would drop dead. And that there was that seeing God's glory in full was so magnificent, it was terrifying. It was so awesome and so powerful that it meant death. If you go to Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1, we're going to see another part in the Old Testament where we're going to see a little bit about God's glory. Right here, Isaiah experienced, the prophet Isaiah experiences a vision. So chapter 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah right here only sees the trim of the Lord's garment. And what does he start to cry out? I'm going to die. I'm not supposed, I'm unclean. His glory is not for me. I am an unclean man and I live among unclean people. But something really cool is we'll go to John 12, verses 36 to 43. When Jesus had said these things, He departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, 
they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Jesus is revealing right here that whose glory did Isaiah see? Isaiah saw the Son's glory. He saw the glory of the Lord, the Son, God, Jesus. This same glory that in Jesus' incarnation, he reveals even greater that Jesus, who John has went painstaking measures to explain to you, is God, the Son. He was before all of creation. He was before all things. Nothing was made without him. All things were made through him and for him. He's come to us. And he's going to reveal God's glory in a way that's even greater than before and more personal than before. And instead of finding death like Moses would have, like the prophets and the high priest would have, like Isaiah would have, we're going to find everlasting life in Christ when we put our trust in him. But don't forget, you deserve the death. On your own, you cannot stand before God's glory. But even just in becoming flesh, Jesus already starts fulfilling that part of yours. That you can be before God's glory. You can see God for who he is. The Son revealing the Father. Jesus is 100% the expression and totality of God. So let's go to verse 15. So verse 15, John, the Baptist, bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Okay. So he starts playing with time since a lot right here. He says, He who's going to come after ranks before me, because he was before me. So what does he mean right there? So this is John the Apostle telling you what John the Baptist said, because this is a real common name at this time. <laughs> and John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament line of prophets. And Isaiah and many other prophets have spoken about what John the Baptist was going to do, that he was going to be a voice crying out in the wilderness. And Brandon and Nate spoke about him some, and you'll get to learn a lot more about him in the next week. So we're just going to touch on this briefly. But John is saying, the Baptist, is saying, the person who's with me presently, Jesus of Nazareth, I told you he would come after me because he is physically younger than me. John's a little bit older than him. And his ministry started later than John's. But... Even though he started after me on this little human timeline, he ranks so far above me because he is before me. So John the Baptist is just what John the Apostle had been pointing to all through this chapter, that Christ is before all of creation, that he is before all things. He is God. He is the Son. So that's what verse 15 right here is really taking more measure to say, hey, this word become flesh, it's the Son, it's God. He came before all of us. We're all created through Him 
before him. And even though his physical body came into a certain point of history, it doesn't have anything to do with where he ranks as king. So then we get into verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So, when you first read this verse, it's easy to think that it's kind of piling on Moses, and it's kind of piling, it's being like, you know, the law came through Moses, and that sucked, but grace and truth, they come through Jesus Christ. And the second part's true, but the first part's not true. Mo- the law is a gift of grace. It was hard to understand in the sense that the purpose of it was to reveal to us our need for a Savior, the ultimate purpose. But it's not hard to understand in the sense of it's real easy to see what it is. Hey, don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't do things that are pretty much obvious. Worship God this way. Don't worship Him this way. And it was made about as clear as day as Emmanuel could be. The kind that when you buy something and you don't know how to build it, but you still just put that thing to the side and say, you know, I'll probably figure it out as I'm going. So, further speaking about the law, no one probably has a more fun human take on the law than Paul in Romans 7. So in Romans 7, starting in verse 7, Paul speaking about the law, that Moses was given through Moses. And he says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For, what, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. So Paul right there, he kind of goes back and forth. And he really does this all throughout Romans 7. And then Romans 8, he clarifies a lot more. It's not that he's saying the law is bad. The law is great. It revealed to us that we're sinners. It revealed to us that we need a Savior. We need a Messiah. We need the Christ. And it's a hard pill to swallow, as you can see in Romans 7, because Paul is going back and forth. And it is a form of grace that God gave us the law through Moses. But we see right here in verse 17 is that that form of grace the law that had been given to us, we're about to receive a greater grace. And that Christ would fulfill the law. Not that he would do away with it, that he would come and fulfill it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, Jesus speaking, says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus fulfills the law. He lived the perfect life. He lived a righteous life. He met the demands of the law that we don't meet. Not because we are incapable of meeting them with our own power, but we're incapable of meeting them because we don't want to meet them. So right here, it's not that it wasn't a grace to receive the law. It was a great grace. But a greater grace, the greater grace bringer, was Christ, and that he would come and fulfill the law for us. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except 
through me. Right here in verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is, e- Jesus is echoing right there. And actually, actually, John the Apostle is echoing what he'd heard Jesus say in person as an apostle. That truth and grace, they can't even be separated from the being, the person of the Son of Jesus. That he is the truth. Spoke about other religions earlier and how you have to go get God. You have to be good and go get God. Just from every world point, it's always going to be find this answer. Find out how to get grace. Find out how to get truth. Find out how to get this. Jesus always points right back to himself. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am life. I am the way. There was no way to God before. No clear, perfect way. Men were still saved by putting their faith and trusting in the Father. Trusting in the promise of the coming Savior. But now, the coming Savior has revealed himself. And he has revealed the Father and his will. That he is the way. He is truth, and he has come to bring a grace that is beyond anything that we had ever spoken of before and understood before, and any kind of grace that's ever been talked about after. Now finally in verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. So just as I talked about a little bit earlier, this verse, it's, it's, I don't know, wordy is the only word I can think of that comes to mind for me. It's, it's almost like if you read through it too fast, you'll probably completely miss what was actually said. So a good way to sum it up is the Son, Jesus, is God. He was with God, and He is God. He was with God. The Son was with God the Father. Now He has come to us to break down that barrier and to reveal the Father to us, to reveal His will to us, to save men and to bring men to His Son. And in John 14, just a few, just one verse earlier than the one I read just a moment ago, Thomas said to him, Lord, We do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The word becoming flesh brings to us grace. It reveals the Father to us. The way to God has been made clear. Have you ever thought that the gospel was simple? That's because it is. The way to God is the Son. The way to God is a person. It's not a road. It's not a set of standards because you couldn't meet those. It is the personhood of the Son who is God. Jesus says if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. So my only question today is have you seen Christ? Have you seen the Son? If you have, the Father's going to be revealed to you. If you have, then you'll put your trust in Him. That He knows you, and you can know Him. And you can put your trust that He has made right your relationship with God the Father. He has went to every measure, and that was how God completely willed it. 
before you were ever born, before you were ever thought of, God had already planned out how he was going to redeem you, how he was going to bring you back to himself. And that was through the brutal death of his son on the cross, dying the sinner's death that you deserve. See the Son. See who Jesus is and put your trust in him. I'm going to read Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and then we'll pray. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Lord, first of all, we want to thank you today for your son. We want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for the word become flesh, that you have stepped into history, that you have done the necessary work that we could not do and would not do, that you have made the way and the way is your son. And it is clear that we have scripture, we have the gospel, you've given us preachers and teachers. Now let us respond and put our trust in you. Let us follow after you. Let us love you if you have loved us. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his coming. And thank you for one day for his second coming. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.